All right. Um, so up till now, uh, we said that we were going to deal with the most difficult uh, problem in contaminant hydrology, which is uh, denapple, the, the denapple problem. And so we talked about multiphase fluids. And we had to understand how they get into place and how we can move them. And that revolves around the capillary pressure saturation curves, which are down off the right-hand side here, and relative permeability uh, curves. And so we know that from when you dump this stuff in, it goes into the ground, it takes up some kind of architecture, and then is present to be dissolved and carried downstream. And so now what we'll talk about is how we characterize the things that you're trying to do already, uh, looking at arrival times you have done, and looking at concentrations at which they'll arrive downstream, uh, and see if those simple models that you've perhaps been using um, hold for all cases. So that's kind of what we'll do. So this is the architecture that we're looking at, where you have a, a source that occurs uh, in some place, and then from that source gets carried downstream. Uh, we know that the flow in that system we can define as being equal to a permeability of the material that doesn't change with the fluid, remember that? A relative permeability, which is a function of saturation, and a pressure gradient. So that gives us a Darcy velocity. Uh, if we have a Darcy velocity, we can get an advective velocity, which is just the Darcy velocity, whoops, Darcy velocity divided by the porosity, which means if it's a small porosity, it speeds it up because it's only flowing through the cross section that is the pore space. And if we know what that uh, advective velocity is, we know that a velocity is a length <coughs> divided by a time, by units, and therefore, uh, the time to travel a given length is equal to the product of the velocity times uh, velocity times one, if we want. Yeah, okay, fine. The time taken is just going to be the length divided by the velocity. Advective velocity. And so we've had some simple relationships for RTD curves that you've pl uh, played around with in your assignments. And so now we'll perhaps deal with that in a bit more of a sophisticated way. So that's the, the topic that we will attack now. And so we'll talk about uh, contaminant transport. Um, won't do much of a, a recap, I don't think. I don't know why this is blinking red at me. Perhaps it's going to run out of juice in a minute. Um, and we're going to talk about the mechanisms by which uh, these components get carried downstream in dissolved form. We'll talk the two main mechanisms are by <coughs> diffusion or dispersion and advection. And uh, we'll explore those. And then we'll talk about different forms of dispersion, which I guess are this one, and divide it into mechanical dispersion and hydrodynamic dispersion. And that's probably about as far as we will get. And so, yeah, it's all right. right. So, so the, the problem I guess we're framing is that if we have this system that does these nice little circles once in a while, if we have this system where we're flowing stuff along it, we know that we can get for all intents and purposes, a pressure gradient, a length. Uh, we just wrote Darcy's law down for the Darcy velocity, permeability over viscosity, relative permeability as a function of saturation, and the pressure gradient. And so from this, we get the uh, Darcy velocity coming out. We can get from that the advective velocity to get um, time is equal to length over velocity, advective. And so we know that from this, if we have these residence time distributions, which you've already started drawing, 
um, both drawn in space and which would look like this where this is length is up is that right time is equal to yes so length is equal to velocity times time or we can look at it where it comes out of here as and we'll try to as you've drawn it as a residence time distribution which would be the ordinates would be a concentration or a relative concentration that goes from one to zero and I guess this residence time distribution as you think of it right now would look like this this is time and this would this ordinate here would be just a rearrangement of this I guess it would be equal to length of velocity ad advective velocity and so I guess I'm gonna pose the question uh, does this really look like this? Is it sharp? Is the length that it travels in a given time given by the product of these two? The velocity, advective velocity times time. And is the resonance time distribution as it breaks through also a, a step function or what might change this? And is, and is this indeed the time at which the breakthrough occurs? So those are the things that we're going to question. You've taken that, I think, probably at my suggestion, as true. It turns out that they're not always, that isn't always true. And the other thing, I suppose, uh, that is a consequence of that, that you've also messed around with, and that is that if you look at the, um, the mass flow rates coming out of here, we've said that, or suggested that you can calculate those mass flow rates as a function of the volumetric flow rate. So this uh, volumetric flow rate, Q is equal to Darcy velocity times area. This is the area here, right? And so you we get these mass flow rates as a function of this times concentration. So this is concentration, which is equal to mass over volume or it could be mass of compound divided by the mass of water but it's the mass of the compound divided by the volume of the fluid it comes through uh, and this is the volumetric uh, flow rate And we could use this to say, so this would be um, a volumetric flow rate, which would be volume over time. So if you multiply these two together, obviously, not obviously, you get mass per unit time. So this is mass of contaminant per time. So that's what we would like to get out of it. And you, you've played around with this. Actually, are you doing the one with the X curve right now? Is that the assignment that's up? So that's how you would get that. Actually, everything on this page is what you'd need. You get a Darcy velocity from looking at the flow rate through it. You're probably better off writing it in terms of heads if this answers anyone's questions. Darcy velocity is also hydraulic conductivity over rho g relative permeability as a function of saturation times dh dx and you have to realize that the head in your cylinder right, doesn't have a like a supernatant fluid sitting on top of it so the head here would be equal to what? It would be equal to this height for the pressure, which is being acted on here, or elevation right, and this amount for the pressure. So this would be the head on the upper portion, 
good thing to take a picture? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and this here, the head is equal to zero, right, by definition. Pressure is zero, atmospheric, elevation, if you take it as zero, is that. And so the gradient will be over this length, right? So the upstream head is this, but the gradient length is this. So, so if that was something that was puzzling you, then that's sorted. So you can use this to calculate the rate at which you remove the components. The rate at which you move the components says how much of the you change the saturation by replacing the free product by water and slowly getting to 100% water and therefore the relative permeability will change slightly. It doesn't change very much because you're already at the top part of the relative perm curve. So. But I digress. So, so you've used both of these and, so you, and perhaps you've taken them as gospel but we'll start perhaps questioning these um, because I guess you could imagine that if this front isn't exactly sharp, then it may mean that you have mixing at the front, and maybe the concentrations aren't quite equal to relative concentrations of one, which is the same as the source where it comes out. Okay? So that's what we're going to try and question. So those are the questions. So we'll skip to this. Yeah, this is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, we looked at it in the previous figures for uh, an L-napple, a D-napple, but it would be the same for an L-napple. You have a pool here that is in contact with the water table. It dissolves into the water underneath it, and as that water advex downstream, it will carry it downstream. If you sit at some kind of compliance point and you get your water from here, then you might be worried about how it gets there and what concentrations it arises. So that's our job for now. So we'll talk about transport mechanisms. We've said there are two, and you know of one of them. Advection is just this plug flow that we've talked about being carried by the, the bulk motion of the water as a, an inconsequential mass loading. So these are parts per billion, parts per million, parts per thousand. They make no difference to the water traveling. It's no great uh, burden on it to carry such small loading. Uh, we know that a velocity is length times time, so an advective velocity gives us the ability to calculate how far it will go in a given time, and you've done that. But the fly in the ointment, perhaps, is that we also have other processes acting um, to uh, transport. And those would be the two that come together, which are diffusion and mechanical dispersion, that together, when we apply them, we call them hydrodynamic dispersion. And they act um, together at the same time. Sometimes one might be dominant compared to the other one, uh, or, or not. And the best way to describe what we're going to do is that you certainly understand, I bet you understand diffusive processes. You've certainly seen fixed law in your background. And so fixed law basically says, fixed second law, I guess. is if we uh, write radius versus concentration, C over C0, two concentrations divided by each other have no units, and so it's just a convenient way to write it. So if you take a beaker, I guess, uh, and put a drop of ink in that beaker, in water, say, and look at what happens to that drop of ink, then over time you'd see that uh, it would change the form of this curve to being T0, T1, and I guess T infinity would be almost horizontal, not quite horizontal, well, horizontal but not zero, right? T infinity. And so this would be if you took uh, some water and put a a bubble, a, a drop of ink in, in water. And so Fick's law says that the diffusive flux is equal to minus a diffusion coefficient times concentration gradient, dx or dr, I guess dr in this particular case. 
It's negative because it flows in the, 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 the flux is in the opposite direction from the coordinate direction. So here the gradient here is, if I draw my triangle, I could do that, right? This is DC dr. So this is a positive gradient. It's in this quadrant. If you have a, if you have a, an xy or an ry coordinate system, this would be a positive gradient. This is negative, etc. So this is a positive gradient, but you know the flux is going to be driven in this direction. So that's the only reason for this, just as in Darcy's law. The gradient of pressure or head is in a certain direction, and the flux goes in the, in the direction of the Cartesian coordinate, which is negative r. So, so this makes this the, so this is positive, this is a positive gradient, so the flux is negative, which means it's flowing in the negative Cartesian direction. It's okay. Too much explanation. And so this is diffusion as it occurs, as you could imagine. It occurs if we had a beaker of water and we put a blob of ink in it and it would just progress over time so that ultimately at time infinity it would just be a cloudy, slightly opaque mess but there would be no discernible bubble. And so this is what it looks like in terms of the progression of that. So this is diffusion. The best way to think about dispersion, well actually the best way to think about advection would be if you take this uh, beaker and walk across the room with it and you do it quickly so that it doesn't change the Manhattan skyscraper thing. It's just being carried across the room. So it moves from a, one location to another physical location on the other side of the room. That would be fine. That would be advection uh, without any kind of dispersion occurring. If you allow diffusion to occur, it would take some time. It's probably quite fast if it's just ink in water. If you imagine instead of driving it just in a beaker, you drive it through a porous medium, then the individual particles of the ink would go on different pathways. And so if you looked at how this skyscraper would turn as you go downstream, it would be sharp here, but it would be a Gaussian distribution downstream. And so this is mechanical dispersion. It's being mechanically dispersed by being forced to flow on this tortuous flow path. And so the way that contaminant hydrology treats um, this mechanical dispersion pro project uh, process is it assumes that because it looks like diffusion, right? If you have diffusion occurring that goes from the skyscraper to being the Gaussian distribution to being flat, this is exactly what it looks like as you go from upstream to downstream, uh, but it's being caused by a different mechanism. It's not really fixed law, but it looks like fixed law, then maybe you can represent it by a process which kind of follows a diffusive process. So that's all we're attempting to do. So we'll include both of these processes together. They're separate, but uh, they get lumped together. Some cases they'll be dominant. Um, mechanical dispersion will be dominant in coarse graded materials where there's a, a big flow velocity and tortuous flow paths. Diffusion will be dominant where it's not moving very quickly, like in a clay or a granite for that matter, where diffusion is the biggest process. So what we'll do is we'll talk about each of these in turn. We'll talk about diffusion as a mechanism. We'll talk about advection as a mechanism and write equations that describe those things um, and combine them together so that we can quantify exactly what this process is as flow goes downstream. So the first is diffusion. You know Fick's law, uh, and we've explained why it has a negative sign in it. This is a mass flux, which is a mass of solute, a mass of bromine uh, per unit area per unit time, uh, as we define it. Typical magnitudes of these diffusion coefficients are something like 10 to the minus 9 uh, meters squared per second. It's a rate at which it travels um, in, in water. And what we can do is we can write a conservation equation. Um, we did exactly the same when we talked about flow. 
never have to reproduce this, but you might like to understand why we talk about mass conservation and other conservation laws in um, 303. And that is that we did this last time. What, what is it? D, V, X, D, X plus D, V, Y, D, Y plus mass rate of accumulation equals zero. Remember, we threw Darcy's law into this. V equals K over mu dpdx. That's all we did. And so I, I guess it's interesting, and perhaps perhaps not interesting to you at all, actually. <laughs> interesting to me that we're using a mass conservation equation for Darcy's law, but by throwing in Darcy's law, it makes it actually a momentum conservation equation. Because this relates a velocity to a pressure. So there's pressure loss as you go from upstream to downstream. And that's kind of the characteristic as a, of a viscous flow. We lose energy as we go from upstream to downstream. So that characterizes the energy transfer. And it's by dragging the fluid against the static grains is how we lose that fluid energy. And so even though it's a conservation equation, it kind of mimics an energy equation. Okay. When we do it for mass uh, conservation in these um, chemical systems, we're actually conserving mass. And so if we write the equation for mass, this is equal to mass in minus mass out equals accumulation. This is accumulation. And this is mass in minus mass out. So there, it's the same. So we don't need to dwell on that. Uh, all we need to realize is that if we have a flux defined in terms of fixed law, we can put that into here. So this says the mass rate of dissolved mass in going in the x direction plus the mass rate going out in the y direction and the mass rates in and out in the z direction have to balance. If they don't, then they accumulate, and the concentration therefore goes up because the mass accumulates. We throw fixed law in there. It changes this into this second order derivative, and we get this outside. And if we simplify it, we get a second order PDE. A bit like our flow equation, but with different coefficients in it, and of course with a concentration instead of a pressure or a head. Right? Our flow equation is something like dp dt is equal to k over mu d2 p dx squared. If we throw this term away, um, if this is 0, then this becomes what we use to draw flow nets. We know that flow nets have streamlines and, equ and, and equipotentials. You do flow, uh, flow nets in 452? Yeah. And so if you know you can draw a net that has right angles in it and all these little boxes are roughly equidimensional, uh, as long as they are wide, then that allows you, that defines exactly your flow system, the simplest way to be able to define it. So this second order PDE is roughly the same as we have for diffusion. Uh, it's called the, this is a diffusion equation. It's for diffusion of mass within a, so far, um, it could be a room, um, wearing perfume as being a, a low concentration of something that diffuses in the room, across the room at some uh, velocity. It's actually the mass concentration that moves. This is also called a diffusion equation, but the diffusion is not of the mass of water in this equation, it's the diffusion of pressure. So maybe a, a small point, but uh, yeah, not, not so relevant. So this would be the behavior that we, if we looking at transport in a room, but what we have in reality, not a, a room, but we have a porous medium. And so if we want to accommodate 
for filling this room with the sand and then having the same transport in it, then we can do that by doing something which would be just to make uh, an equivalent diffusion coefficient. So you take the diffusion coefficient which is in a porosity of 100% and it would be in, could be in air or water. They would be different diffusion coefficients. The only important thing is 100% and you add a term to it to make it appropriate for the fact that when it goes from A to B it can't go in a straight line as it would do in a room, open room. It has to weave its way through a tortuous flow path. And so you can define a value of this tor um, omega term which is related to, to the tortuosity of the flow path. If it has a long sinuous flow path then the value of this omega will be progressively less, right? Because it will slow it down progressively more. This is an index of how quickly it will diffuse across the room. If you want it to go more slowly because it's having to go on this tortuous flow path, then this coefficient should be smaller than one. Right? And typical values of it would be something like this. A hundredth, half to a hundredth. So we won't worry about that. So we can use this to represent diffusive flow in our porous medium. We need to be able to solve that the equation that we have. Why has it done this? That's kind of bizarre. It's got this little key here. So if we want to solve this, uh, we need to provide, uh, how would we do this? Well, we'll draw this diagram multiple times, but perhaps it's worthwhile drawing it just here. I don't care, we're not, this isn't a class in PDEs. Um, and so we're going to just use the solutions to do this. So if we think about the upstream boundary conditions, then the upstream boundary conditions we are apply are in terms of time and concentration. This would be T0. If we look at the flow along here, this is X now and this is C, then this would look at some time maybe a bit like this. This is T equals something, two, I don't know, sometime. And if you looked at the residence time distribution at the other end, then this again would be time and this would be concentration. And I suppose we might expect it to look like this, where this is T breakthrough, which what do we say? T is equal to length over advective velocity. Not always true, but good enough for now. So this is kind of our system. We have water flowing through here at some advective velocity. Actually, for now, the advective velocity is equal to zero because it's diffusion we're looking at. We have an upstream boundary condition that is suddenly turned on at time zero and kept at that magnitude. And that results in something happening in the core that makes this stuff uh, travel. The way we've drawn this is kind of indicative of having an advective velocity carried down as plug, plug flow. I guess if it wasn't plug flow, we might expect it to look more like this. So this is if velocity is equal to zero. And so that's the, the system for this. There is no velocity in this. It's a stagnant core with stagnant fluid in it. And so the solution for this uh, differential equation for these boundary conditions, that the upstream boundary condition is initially zero. So initially everywhere in this core the concentration is zero. And then at the upstream location, x equals zero, which is here. We turn it on at time t equals zero. So this is the kind of mathematical description of what we're doing. This is the step function that we apply at the upstream. And if we solve that, this is the equation that describes it.
which happens to be a complementary error function, um, which is a special function. I guess you get it by, again, not a course in solution, sol solutioning, solving differential equations. But if you take a Gaussian distribution, the so-called bell curve, this would be concentration or relative concentration. And this is, so this is uh, exactly what we looked at before. I erased this after I'd drawn it. This is what comes from our skyscraper. Right? So this is how the skyscraper attaches. I guess the sky skyscraper is infinitely thin. So it's really just actually here on this axis of some height. It's equivalent to this. You turn it on and you allow it to do this. So this distribution, if you were to integrate this curve from uh, integrate the concentration dx and plot the cumulative distribution So if you take this area here, up to this point here, x, and then you take the area all the way up to this point, that's all this integration is, then you get the cum cumulative probability distribution, right, by definition. And so as you sum it up, you know that by the time you get to this point here, you have half of the concentration. So if you plot this cumulative distribution, I guess it would probably look like this. Or if you do it upside down, it would look like this. And so this is 1 minus that. And so this is starting at this point, where the deviation from 1 is 0. Once you get to the 50% mark, you're right here. And this is the length at which it occurs. And so in the same way that you think of this Gaussian distribution as being described by the standard distribution, often given by uh, sigma, right? Standard distribution, standard deviation gives you how wide this curve is. Then if you unravel this curve as a cumulative distribution, this is the curve you get. The 50% mark gives you the location which, as the standard deviation gets wider and wider, then this moves further and further downstream. So this is the upstream portion of the core. You're keeping the concentration 1.0. At time zero, the distribution would look like this. At time one, it would look like this. At time two, it would look like this. Time three, maybe this, etc. And so this allows you to say exactly what the concentration distribution looks like as you go downstream. And so if you look in this term, this green curve is exactly what that is. So if you know what this coefficient is, we know what the solution to this equation is, we can find out everywhere in our, along our core exactly what the distribution is. So in other words, this, this here. For one case, the case where the velocity of flow is equal to zero. So we can define that. So that defines our diffusion. If we want to look at advection, then we could do exactly the same as we've done before. We know that now we're going to turn it on so that it has a velocity. The velocity, if it's not equal to zero, you think will give you partly plug flow. And I suppose if there's some diffusion, then this won't be a straight uh, vertical front. And so the way that we deal with that is we know that the advective velocity is given by this, written in terms of a head gradient and hydraulic conductivity and porosity. So this term in here is just the Darcy velocity, right, divided by porosity. The flux that's carried by the advecting fluid, the, carried by the water that goes through the system, is given by the concentration of that flux multiplied by its Darcy velocity, 
this term here is the Darcy velocity because advective velocity um, is equal to Darcy velocity over porosity. So this is just, so if you multiply this Darcy velocity by the area, it would give you a volumetric flow rate. And so the, this is a flux per unit area. If you multiplied both sides by area, then this term here would be what we've called Q, right? We said before that the mass flow rate is equal to Q times concentration. And that's all this, this term is. And so again, we can take fixed first second law and we can throw it into our conservation equation. We could have diffusion occurring in X, Y, and Z at the same time, driven by the concentration gradients in each of those directions. And we get an expression that looks like this. Don't care about it. And finally, an equation that looks like this. And you'll see that in both cases we have an accumulation term and a mass in minus mass out. Dissolved mass being carried by the water. So what goes in and doesn't come out has to accumulate and it accumulates by raising the concentration which means that there's more of that substance present within the control volume. And so that's what we're representing. So if we take this equation 5, which looks like this, and we already have an equation, I don't know, do we have a number to it? Perhaps we didn't have a number to it. And we combine it with this other equation. They both look uh, are defined by a, a mass accumulation term. So we can look at the mass that accumulation, accumulates due to diffusion and the mass that accumulates by advection. That's all we're doing. Then we would end up with an equation, I'll write it in the top here, that would look something like um, const the accumulation term, which is this left-hand side. Uh, and in simplified way, it would look something like Longitude and needle diffusion, we'll talk about later. D2 C dx squared plus D transverse dispersion, D2 C dy squared plus advective velocity times DC dx. And so this is the advection diffusion equation. Called so because it includes both of those components, advection and diffusion combined. We've just superposed them. And in terms of the components, this equals accumulation mass in and mass out. Where this is mass in minus mass out due to diffusion dispersion. It's just called diffusion for now. And this is due to advection. So, getting a bit busy. And so we'll never solve those equations. We'll use some solutions to them. It's good that you understand kind of what the components represent. And that's what is kind of shown pictorially here, I guess. So we're going back to this same, this is the boundary condition. So we, we, we drew it this way. We have a boundary condition that we apply on this upstream face. Uh, that boundary condition gives us a behavior that we have in the core in terms of the distribution of concentration in space. And when it comes out the other end, it gives us a residence time distribution. So this is kind of the way that we'd like to, to represent this.
And that's exactly what we're doing here. I guess I don't have the downstream part. So the downstream part would be the residence time distribution, which would be time and concentration. And I guess it would look like this or this, right? So the case we're making is that this, we turn it on at some time, and this background item there, I don't know what that is. We turn it on some time, and it changes the concentration of the upstream face. This is our core that we're flowing through. If you need any more. And this is what the concentration distribution looks like. So um, this is a one-dimensional problem. And so the concentration gradients in the y direction, which would be across the core, right? The y direction would be in this direction. We're going to say we don't have them because we're just changing the concentration everywhere on this face, so it has to be no concentration gradient in that direction. So this term is going to be zero. So we only have these ones to deal with. So this is the equation that we'd solve with these three parts. So the advection term is this step curve, which is this. So I guess this is the Infection. So this is the red curve here. And if there's no dispersion, then that's the case when the longitudinal dispersion is equal to zero. You absolutely get plug flow and you get this thing moving. It's not changed in any way. So the concentration when it ad arrives downstream indeed is equal to the upstream concentration, which would be a relative concentration of one. This is C over C zero. Zero. And so this would be the case where the dispersion is equal to zero. If this isn't zero, then what this curve would look like, it would get spread out. And if uh, this would be a longitudinal dispersion which is small, and this would be one which is large, larger. So as it gets progressively larger, this front gets canted over. And you can imagine that what's going on is that um, you have a porous medium. There's a bunch of flow paths you have through here. As you, uh, I guess I don't really want to do blue because I don't want you to think it's water. This is what's being carried through there as particles of, I don't know, some compound. And so if you imagine what it looks like upstream, this is the concentration profile as you start off here. And as you go downstream, this is the Gaussian distribution that you get. If you look along the the path, then because of this distribution here, you'd expect to see something like this. It's getting further spread out, so if you do something as a, a line through the side, you'd expect to see a front, but it'd be moved out of the, the direct, um, as the crow flies line of travel, and so it would decrease in concentration. So two things happen. One, you don't get a, a discrete arrival here. But you could also imagine that this curve perhaps doesn't stay at 1. We don't know, but we think it might not. The corresponding behavior for this same equation, but where you have a different boundary condition, is if you have a, a kind of a, uh, a point source that's ephemeral. It's turned on and turned off. So it's turned on, and almost immediately later it's turned off. Then it'll travel down as a discrete pulse. If it's not... Um, suffering from any dispersion. If this term is zero, 
then it'd be this red pulse as it goes downstream. If it's progressively more and more um, dispersed in the system, then it would go from this one with a little dispersion to this one with a lot. And I guess downstream, what would it look like? Well, it would look like either this or this. And the interesting thing here, so this would be no dispersion, plug flow, and this would be with dispersion. I guess the interesting thing is that some of it can arrive quite early. So you're thinking it's not going to arrive here because based on your advective flux or advective velocity, it shouldn't get here until some time, but it arrives early because it's going down these sinuous flow paths. So uh, we'd like to know exactly what this curve looks like and therefore this resonance time distribution. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to know exactly what these coefficients are, which we haven't really said much about. And so perhaps the easiest way to explain that is again to draw a picture. I guess I used up most of my space. Torches. So the equation we're trying to solve is uh, what, yeah. dc dt is equal to dl dt times d2c dy squared plus. And so you could think about this as our system we've drawn. Or you could think about it in terms of um, kind of a, an aquifer, which looks just like that. But in plan view, we're interested in seeing exactly what it is. Oh, I'm going to outdo myself here, I can tell. And so this is our aquifer. If we don't care how thick it is. But we have an x and a y coordinate. And so if we have a, a source sitting in our aquifer, it's actually it's a bit like your BTEX thing, then we know that over time the contours of concentration, if you're looking at it in plan view, will look like this. And so this is carried downstream at some velocity, advective velocity in the x direction. Um, these would be contours. So I guess if we looked at it from the side, this concentration profile, C over C0 versus x would look like this. We said that in this particular case, we only have, if the concentration across this face is uniform, then dc dy, there is no gradient in that direction, right? It's just, it's the same everywhere you go across this face, every point has the same concentration. So by definition, the change in concentration of the location is, is null. And so if that's the case, we can get rid of this term here because the concentration is zero. If we have a two-dimensional problem, we can't do that. And so it'll look like this. And at some respect, um, this spreading in this direction is going to be controlled by what we refer to as the longitudinal dispersion. And the spreading, I guess, that we have in the other direction if I can draw it. <laughs> 
the spreading is going to be controlled by the transverse. Dispersion. So if we can figure out exactly what these values are in this, then we have enough to be able to solve for these kinds of behaviors, which we'd like to know, because these affect the distribution of contaminants in the aquifer. They control the rates at which it's removed from its source, and they control the times of arrival and in what concentrations downstream. So that's where we're going with this. This is a, a negative sign, minus. Right. Where were we? Right. So we said before that diffusion and our diffusion equation, we deal with it because it includes these two terms, diffusion, straight diffusion, chemical diffusion, and also mixing, mechanical dispersion. So how do we accommodate those terms together? Mechanical dispersion. We can think of due to three reasons. Um, one is if we have a porous medium that has small pore throats and big pore throats, we know that the velocity you can flow stuff through a capillary pipe changes with the diameter of the pipe. Small pipes have a lot of uh, viscous resistance and slow flow, and big open pipes are fast. So any particles of stuff moving from upstream will go slowly down the constricted paths and quickly down the open paths. So that means that they have two particles starting at the stop, the, f the beginning line at the same time, and going downstream will arrive downstream at different times. This one will arrive later than this one, and therefore, intrinsically, you get exactly the kind of behavior that you'd expect. Since this is only arriving later, then you'd think that the concentration along this profile would look like this. Just intuitively you'd think that. If you think the fact that it might take different paths to go downstream, short paths would get it downstream quickly, a long path, tortuous path would get it more slowly. So if different particles take different routes to get to the same physical finish line, then you'd imagine also that they arrive in different concentrations as you go downstream and also be spread across the, the width. And the other one uh, you could perhaps think of would be is what's called Taylor dispersion after its originator. And that comes from the idea that if you have flow down a pipe, you know that the velocity profile across a pipe is parabolic. It looks like this, which is kind of what this drawing is here. The maximum velocity is dead in the middle. The velocity at the edge of the pipe is zero. And so in the same way, if you had a slow pathway and a fast pathway, any distribution of material that starts off all on the same start line will end up at the finishing line much, much later at the edges and much earlier in the middle. And so spreading occurs as a result of that. And so this little picture down here is exactly showing what you would have in these particular cases this kind of spreading. So, so we want to be able to accommodate this behavior. And so this behavior that you have here is also the same as we did on our little block diagram showing the two-dimensional aquifer and the plan view of the concentrations. So what we'd like to do is come up with some coefficient that describes this behavior. And what is found is that the mechanical dispersion is proportional to the velocity and some coefficient. And this coefficient is called the coefficient of long longitudinal dispersion when it acts on the flow downstream, this here. And the coefficient of transverse or lateral dispersion, I guess it's better to use transverse so it's not another L that we use, which is this. And they scale with the magnitude of the, the velocity. So if you double the velocity, this coefficient still describes what's going on, 
but the effective dispersion that you get would be double, twice as bad, twice as severe, if you like. And so we can characterize the behavior like this. And so since when we started out on this journey, we said that we could look at these two different forms of, uh, they are mix, I guess they're transport, but they're also mixing, diffusion and mechanical dispersion. We can combine them into a single behavior, which includes both of them added together. Then what we can do is we can take the two components and put them together in a coefficients of longitudinal hydrodynamic dispersion, which is this term here. This is longitudinal, and this is transverse. And all we've done is we've taken the mechanical ones and non-mechanical diffusive ones. So this is our equivalent diffusive diffusion coefficient, which you remember was the diffusion coefficient you get out of a textbook for bromine or chlorine in water or chlorine in air and multiply it by a correction factor for the fact that we're going through a porous medium. And this is the one that relies on a coefficient multiplied by velocity. And so now when we put that into our advection dispersion equation, this automatically takes care of the fact that the different processes will be operative in different materials to different degrees. So if we take clays, um, if we apply a pressure gradient, dpdx or dhdx, then we know that the advective velocity is equal to k over mu 1 over porosity dpdx. No matter how big a pressure gradient we apply, if the permeability is really small, then this advective velocity is very small, and therefore these advective velocities will also go to zero. And so if these both go to zero, then the only term remaining in our dispersion coefficient will be the diffusion. So if we plug it in, we'll get out of it the exact term we want, which is the diffusion coefficient for clays. If we look at the advective uh, velocity in something where the permeability is high, then this term is not zero. This term is not zero. This term doesn't change very much. So we said this term might be 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. It's not going to change very much. It's going to be multiplied through by a coefficient, which we said was a half to a hundredth, perhaps, a small number, less than one. So this term isn't going to change, but this term is going to get large as we get a larger velocity. So this term becomes dominant, and we lose this term. And so this is the way that we can accommodate those two behaviors for those two different materials, just by using the same hydrodynamic dispersion coefficient are these two numbers here. And these are exactly the numbers that we talked about uh, you know, two pages back at the bottom of our um, introductory page, this page here that I added, these terms here. So we have everything to be able to um, solve our equation. And so the reason, I guess the one thing I didn't explain, I kind of short-circuited it, uh, this allows us, therefore, if we know what these coefficients are, to be able to solve this equation that we talked about, which I won't go back to. And so we can look at how the plume appears as it goes downstream for this particular behavior. And I guess I kind of pulled this out of a hat, but where does this come from? Well, you could do some experiments where you where you flow material along at some advective velocity and you use this experiment to calculate from 
I suppose it would be the arrival times. This is time versus concentration. And I guess I didn't lose, leave myself very much space. X and C over C zero. So you could imagine doing an experiment with a piece of core that would allow you to calculate an effective diffusion coefficient that comes along here. So you know that this advection diffusion equation um, would predict exactly when this would arrive. This advection diffusion equation looks like this. We've said that we have solutions to this, which look like this cumulative, this Gaussian distribution term, which gives us this cumulative distribution function, which looks like this. So if you can fit the arrival data or the data inside the core to this equation, it would give you an effective diffusion coefficient by doing an experiment. And if you plot that diffusion coefficient for a variety of different velocities, you'd get a curve like this. At low velocities, you get a whole series of points like this. And at high velo higher velocities, you'd get some diffusion coefficients that might change. So these would be experimental data. So if you take this magnitude of your measured dispersion coefficient from this experiment, and you divide it through by the diffusion coefficient for our porous medium, which is just, remember, the chemical diffusion coefficient times omega, which is this term. Then, if this is our equation that we just defined, if we divide this equation through by d star, d star, maybe d, so this term is just equal to 1. And this term is equal to this parameter here on the left-hand side. Then you see that the data fit this behavior, where this is the magnitude of kind of a normalized, real mechanical dispersion coefficient along the length of the core. It's normalized by the chemical one. And when the velocity is equal to 0, the value of these points should be equal to 1. That's exactly what these are, which is just equal to this. This term falls out because this velocity is equal to 0. If now you do an experiment where the, the velocity is progressively uh, 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100 centimeters a second, centimeters a day, doesn't matter what the units are, then all of a sudden the value of this is going to increase and you'd expect your measured value, I think my screen has gone dead, so I can't do that, then the measured value of this is going to be increase, and it will, at some stage, become more significant than this one. And that's exactly what you see here. So here, on this log-log plot, you see this curve here in log-log space is one-on-one. -on -one. So if I drew my little triangle with a side, uh, with this is the hypotenuse, this is the vertical, this is the horizontal, then this would be one by one in log-log space. And so this is saying that this defines this particular coefficient. So this is where that rule comes from, that the, uh, hydro the, the mechanical mixing portion of the dispersion coefficient is proportional to velocity. It comes not by pulling it out of a hat, but by doing some experiments seeing what the results are for how dispersion increases as a function of the velocity of flow within the sample, plotting them up in a clever way, and then analyzing the data to be able to say exactly how it breaks down. So the fact that as you linearly inc increase velocity, you linearly increase the dispersion, then you can say that this relationship is directly uh, proportional to velocity. So that's it. I thought I charged my thing up today, so I don't know why it crapped out on me. <laughs>
you could measure this coefficient for dispersion along the sample or you could dev devise an experiment where you see how far it spreads out laterally to do the same thing and get the same results. Uh, slightly different curves, but rather similar results. And that's it, I think. So, that's it. so what we'll do now, I guess, not today, but now, as we carry on, we have a reasonably good understanding, I hope, of what drives this behavior. I'll draw with my finger instead of on my pad. It's this advection dispersion equation that controls behavior. Um, we choose it because the dispersion that we're looking at looks like diffusion. We lump diffusion and mechanical dispersion together because it's a process that looks the same for each one, even though the mechanisms by which they occur are different. We lump them together into these coefficients. We can define what these coefficients are as a function of the material we're pushing fluids through. And if we can come up with numbers for each of these terms, which we have, and for advective velocity, we can look at how the distribution of concentrations change with time in the aquifer, across the aquifer, and also downstream at our RTD curve. And I guess we're ready to answer the question is whether this simple plug flow models that we've used apply or do not apply, and if they do apply, when do they apply, and if they don't, when do they not apply, and how badly do they not apply, and how do we solve systems for that case. So that's what we're dealing with now. <laughs>